and um, getting different perspectives and, and larger classes sometimes that's very actually can be more difficult in, yeah. in my estimation, but let's pray. So Lord God, we are here because of you. We are here because we love you people, cities, and we love creativity. Be the author of everything said in this meeting. Help us to grow and develop. Help us to embrace all that you are and keep us in your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So we're, we're, we're in kind of a, a, a groundbreaking course here. We, other universities have been moving forward and doing work in this. I don't know if you all know Brandeis University in Boston has has really broken ground in the arts and community transformation and the arts and social justice. The arts and social advocacy is, is the, uh, was the focus of my master's degree. And I pretty much designed it at Regis University in Denver, which is a Catholic university. And they were very open. The Catholics tend to be very open to social justice issues. So I've done a lot of work myself in uh, trafficking, and poverty, uh, mass incarceration, and utilizing the arts to bring these kinds of issues to the forefront for uh, communities to actually take a look at these realities and make some decisions and face them. We, we love to run from the truth, don't we? We like the, and we are actually wired for beauty and goodness and truth. We are not wired for the darkness. So that is okay. That's actually, sometimes it's a good idea to get out of the way of a moving truck but we don't want to avoid the truth and leave people in places of suffering when God has definitely called us to make a difference. Okay, so those are my opening comments about the class, and I, I, I definitely want yours. Before we move forward, I just want to mention a couple of issues. Uh, the um, I really enjoyed your book reports. So I was in my past life, one of my past lives, I was an English teacher. And on the high school level, you will see that break forward in frightening ways on your work that you turn in. But I, um, I am a stickler for punctuation and just basic grammar and writing well. So we'll work together on that. But you all did beautifully. Remember to keep your book reports, please, to three. Uh, Natalia, am I supposed to be recording this? Sorry. Well, I started a recording for you, so we're fine. Oh, OK. I'm so glad. All right. Um, keep your book reports please to three paragraphs you can look on the syllabus to kind of get the specifics i think your organization and your thought processes were phenomenal though and i very much appreciate what you had to say so we also have um, midterm projects coming up and the the focus of your midterm project again that's on the syllabus is due this saturday night at midnight just just send me a notice if it's open. I'm not going to say you can't do it. This is a creative project. It does not involve writing. It's about uh, utilizing your creativity. So, so be crazy. It's totally fine to be crazy. I'd like it to have some kind of application to healing the cities or the arts and, and, and community transformation. It can be theology-based or sociology-based. The sky's the limit. I'm not, I just want to know what your, what your focus is and, I, and know that you're thinking about it. We will present those then at the third Zoom. So this is our first Zoom. Our second Zoom meeting is in two weeks and Brian Bakke, who is a really good friend and this amazing person that is crazy and over the top and an artist and a social advocate is going to be sharing some of his stories. He also is the I believe the North and South American director of Natalia, help me. Do you know who I'm talking about? I just lost it. Uh, the Mustard Seed Foundation. Okay. So he is going to be uh, guest lecturing. And he's not, we're just saying that. He's, you will love him. He's amazing. The, anything else? Any, any bookkeeping questions on your part? I, I just have a question about the book reviews. Um, in the, also, in the, please be processing about uh, final projects, what you want your theme to be for your final project. All right, so I wanted to open with uh, developing our narratives more so that we can process forward into more of a sense of community. The more we know each other, um, the more that we pray for each other. I think it's important that we pray for each other as we process forward in gaining all that the Lord has for us and 
understanding the arts and healing the cities. Um, there's a lot we could say we can say about that. Is it over the top? Does does God really use the arts to heal the cities? We'd like to try. That's why we're doing this class to see if we can send you guys out there to uh, go over the edge into the roaring waters of God's purposes and love and and a gracious plan for all of our cities. So, but let's begin with our narratives. I know that we all introduced ourselves. And yet I think that if we do it again and we, and we put a little more color to it, a little more depth, a little more information and we connect it with the faces, I think when we post, it's going to make a difference. I think that we'll have more interaction and maybe a little more depth of relationship. Oh, posts. I want to encourage you all to be as developed in your responses and your posts as possible. We can do more. You've been doing I'm just thinking we can process more. Okay, so who would like to launch? And, and then this means tell us about your families, uh, the work that you do a bit more specifically. Anthony, I know that you're um, out in the mainstream and you're a teaching pastor at a church in Tucson, correct? Right, right. I'm, Why I'm don't you launch? Sure, I'm happy to go first. Uh, I am, uh, I am a hybrid in life. I, I was born in the home of a, a pastor, a Baptist pastor. My mom was a, a public school teacher with a love for music. So grew up with a love for music, love for the church. Probably missed church a total of 10 times growing up. Thought it would be a mortal sin to do so. Um, I've kind of- uh, That's Catholic. Through a, yeah, through a number of circumstances, uh, edited that somewhat over the past years. But um, I found my true love uh, my wife uh, actually in the community that I was going to be planning a church in after I graduated seminary she had come there as part of a college group to do some community work uh, for a young pastor that was coming into town to start a church so she was leaving town I was entering town and I thought to myself who's that uh, so we connected the next summer and um, um, asked her to marry me and she said yes we we have been in and out of ministry over the past 32 years together. Uh, I pastored a church in Canada uh, for about six, seven years, was interim pastor of a church in Canada for a couple of years. We moved to, to the Toronto area, a great metropolitan uh, community, and uh, enjoyed the environment, thought something was going to come about there that didn't really transpire as we thought. So welcome to life. And uh, a church in Tucson, of all places, invited us to come uh, pastor. I was born in Tucson, but we moved when I was two. I had cousins here. Never thought I would come back to live here. It was always a place to visit and go swim and eat pizza. That was the depth of Tucson to me. As a kid. I like it. Yeah, I did too. Um, so we, we, we moved here in 1993. Um, our three boys were raised here. Um, all of them are are artists more than they are um, athletes. Perhaps that's the primary comparison. Artists more than they might be um, math or science scholars. Um, my oldest son has uh, a wonderful singing voice. Uh, participated in the Tucson, Arizona Boys Course growing up. Uh, they tour all over the world. And um, he's not singing as much as I'd like for him to now, but it was a great experience for him and for us to be involved. My younger two boys were involved in the band. Um, my middle son is a percussionist, and my youngest son is a trumpet player. And he was very active in the jazz um, and the marching arts coming along. So, um, in our church here in Tucson, I, I pastored for probably six and a half years, um, stepped down in 2000, and a member of my church asked me what I was going to do. I said, well, i probably transition to another church as God opens the door. And he said, well, I need, I need help. Uh, our firm's growing, and I need someone to help us. Uh, would you be willing to just do some grunt work for a while between jobs? And I said, I can do that. Uh, so that was 18 years ago, and I've, I've never left. They uh, have treated me very well. I've transitioned to become a, a principal with the firm, 
I learned an entirely new profession. I uh, learned a lot about strategic thinking. And, and it, strangely, in the middle of communicating that strategic plan, there's a very important element of data design communication. So there is an artistic element, um, even within the, what would appear to be ironclad um, environment of data that we serve up to our clients. So um, I think I've, I think I've done well because I, I, I like to think I play well with others. I brought into this profession out of my pastoral background, a sensitivity to others and um, an ethic and a belief in personal relationships. So that's all been good. Um, I have continued to pastor as God has opened doors, uh, primarily interim positions. And then my position at Emmanuel Baptist Church right now is as a teaching pastor, one of three rotating teaching pastors. So th that's been kind of cool. The, the, the preaching has been a laboratory for my Baki work to date. So I, I tend to take <laughs> I tend to take what I'm doing in course and uh, transition it and take it directly to the pulpit uh, for a month and talk about so I talk about um, asset based community development for a month. I talked about um, um, theology of work about um, how we need to rethink what calling is and uh, um, eliminate the great divide that exists between uh, uh, sacred and secular, those kinds of things. Uh, the personal assessment, I, I, that course was difficult for me because I, I've obsessed for 58 years on who I am and what I want to be when I grow up. And uh, I was concerned that having my face pushed down in that again for a quarter would not be productive, but actually it was productive. It was a great experience. I've been thinking how to transition that into the local church because I think there's a lot of great material there. Um, mm -hmm. So now we get to this course. This is my fourth course. And I was actually very excited about this because um, when I graduated from high school with no real clear vision on what I wanted to dedicate my life to, I, I put together a portfolio and applied to the School of Fine Arts at the University of Manitoba in Canada. And they accepted me. And so I started, my first foot in higher education was in fine arts. I, I, um, it was odd though. I, 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 you know, it's kind of funny because my very first experience in art class was, uh, I, I walked in, I was the second person in this big open drawing room, um, met a guy from China who was there. And then there was this woman in the corner wearing this long sweater. So, so I'm a Baptist kid. <clears throat> And uh, uh, students gather, gather. We all have our easels there. And this professor comes in. It's like she's from Brooklyn. But she says, so you all want to be artists? Draw this. And this girl steps up, disrobes, gets on the platform. And, you know, my jaw hits the floor. Um, and so that was, that was, you know, my introduction to, to the environment. Uh, met some great people. But I, I discovered in that that... I don't think I am at my heart an artist, um, I, but I do appreciate the arts. And, and I feel like over the years, I've kind of given something away that's somewhat core to who I am. And that is um, a love for music, a love for painting, um, a love for the, the historicity, the connectivity of it to other parts of life. Um, there was a show that BBC did years ago called The Ascent of Man. And they did a great job tying music and art and literature together uh, through the years, especially through the Renaissance, post-Renaissance era. So, um, love it. I was excited to see this course come up. Um, and and I, I didn't know exactly where it was going, but I, I thought maybe this is part of the next step for me in figuring out how to, <laughs> how to have a Renaissance of the arts in my own life and in my ministry. Um, and bring back something that I think is is a disaster in our country, where we have we have pushed the arts out of public school. It is such a second class um, offering for most students, and I just think it's a tragedy. I mean, amazing high school students, very gifted, and all the time. And I'd say, what are you going to do with that voice? It's an incredible gift. What are you going to do with that? 
musical ability, that painting ability. And well, I'm going to go into, you know, engineering. Well, that's great, but I hope you're not going to lose that because you can move people with that. You know, you can change people. So I've probably talked too long. That's a little bit why I'm here. Um, and looking forward to it. Enjoyed the conversation so far. Thank you, Anthony. And I just want to take a second to, well, we lost Krista. I was going to welcome Krista. Um, we lost her for a minute. Anthony, two things uh, resonate with me. Your comment about strategic thinking. I think that is the profundity uh, in, within the context of our culture. Our culture, we're losing creativity and innovation. The arts are an empowerment of that along with study of the all of the humanities and that is our fight i personally believe that christ followers are called to carry that torch and that's in part why i'm doing what i'm doing and why we're doing this class your second comment saying that you do not think you are an artist hard, i would challenge that i, I definitely hear it so, i what 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 Krista. Welcome. Thank you for, for uh, joining us. I know that you had to be late. I just wanted to say welcome. We're glad you're here. You need to unmute. Can you unmute your mic? And yeah, sure. Sorry. And, I'm very distracted by all of this. Oh, that's okay. Let me see if I can get Renee. I don't want to unmute her right now. Why are you here? Go to your class. The teacher is there. Record the motto to the teacher. Okay, I've got access. Natalia, are you there? There we go. Hey, Renee. You have to unmute, Renee. I unmuted you just now. Thank you, Natalia. Renee? Oh, I'm sorry about that. I thought I was on mute because teachers are in the classes and they're still sending the students to me. Right. They figure that I am a superwoman and they are the ones who should take, be responsible for their class because I just went on the block, circled the school, and then the students, they are out of their class. But I have to do now what I have to do. I'm on my lunch break now. Well, thank you. That's totally fine, Renee. Just remember to mute when you have someone coming into your room that needs to discuss something with you. That's totally fine. We understand. We're glad you're here. This is part of being community. I just right. wanted to ask about your narrative. So obviously you work at a school. Tell us more about that. <laughs> right. My name is Renee Level and I work as a Dean of Discipline at Cumberland High School. The school is located in Portmore and in the entire St. Catherine, my school is one of the, would be one of the most at-risk students that attend my school. These students are from Valentine community where they see violence every day. Their parents do negative activities. So the culture at my school is totally at a different setting and they are operating below average. The average that the, the grade that the students come to my school with, they are below 10%, 20%. They know that they have behavioral problems also, so they are remedial. And I have 1,090 students, and we have 700 boys, mainly boys. The rest are females. So. I will be here from six o'clock in the morning because students will be here, but my work starts at eight o'clock, but students are here. So being the Dean of Discipline, also in charge of safety and security. So I'm not only have to take care of students, but adults work with the security guards at the school to ensure that everyone is safe and secure and also communicate with the community. And I'm also a justice of the peace for the parish of St. Catherine. And I also sit on a school board in, here in Jamaica at a basic school. I'm on the board to see how the school would operate. So doing this program, BUG, will help me a lot in the work that I'm carrying out. And it's also helped me along my personal development where I get also to express myself in 
the courses that I have done because I did not get a lot to really express the person that what I'm really going through because every day I will be after wearing a mask coming to work, ensuring that everyone is okay and wasn't thinking about myself and end up in a, basically a depression stage. Mm. So doing, especially this art course is really healing me a lot. I am reaching out to past my classmate, Anthony was one of the person who really helped me along my journey. I'm still going through that phase but doing this course, I am really praying to God and watching God really working towards my life, blessing my life. And I am willing to take on the button to continue to serve and carry out the Lord ministry. So I'm just open up to learn and to develop myself in what I'm doing. You have an amazing job, Renee, and a lot of responsibility. It sounds like stress and pressure will definitely be praying about the depression. I'm grateful that it's lifting. Right. Can you tell us a little bit about your family? Right, I am from the rural parish. My mom and dad live in St. Anne. My siblings, they're, they're living in England, growing up in a rural community. He's at Yorkes High School that is in St. Ann. Growing up in a small family where also I'm from, um, my great grandma, my grandma, my brother know they are pastor. So I grew up in a church setting. So hence for me to want to be a missionary and very loving family and go up, they do farming. That's what they used to send me to school. And I do a lot of farming also. I'm from the agriculture background. Right. Now you've mentioned in post that you, you have had some experience with art therapy. Right, yes. Back in the days when I used to work at Rise Life Management Services and the prison system in Jamaica, I was training art therapy to use art therapy and performing arts to, with, with students that experience um, violence in the community. At that time, I used to supervise seven inner city community and work in the juvenile facility. Right, I thought that work was hard, but coming here to work in the school system is much harder for me because once you go there, the community person, you will see transformation taking place and person appreciate what you are doing. So in this school setting, it's like you're working with the students and you're not basically seeing the changes that you want to see. Because when they go back home, they take on that negative baby and they come back to school. So you have to keep on um, re-administering a different approach. So that will take a longer time to see changes. Renee, this is important work. I just want you to know we support you and we're praying for you. It's amazing. I really appreciate learning about this work. Betty, right. I want to take just a minute to welcome you. We're glad you're here. I'm glad to be here. Wonderful. And Krista, we've just been doing, we've just been deepening our narrative, just saying a little more than what we might have shared the first week. And meeting each other face to face kind of helps putting a face to the narrative. So family, marriage, the work you're doing, can you tell us a little more? Sure. Okay, good. Krista. Krista, thank you, by the way, for giving me the number. I couldn't have gotten over if you hadn't given me the ID number. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> uh, so, yes, uh, greetings from the land where marijuana is now legal since 24 hours. <laughs> so that is, it is a very hot topic, uh, especially in Quebec, interestingly. It's actually bizarre, um, but Quebec is establishing some stricter laws than other provinces. So, anyways, it's a it's relevant if to I my... might interrupt, Krista, I'm, I'm a Colorado girl. Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, so we are way, way down the road from you guys. And I went to the University of Colorado in my undergraduate years. And um, that's all I'm going to say. 
that, that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> so welcome. <laughs> yeah, well, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think one of the differences is that uh, pot will be government controlled or is government controlled now here in Canada, where I'm not sure that's the case in Colorado. It's supposed to be. It, um, we're working on that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Krista, will it be sold like through a like the like the liquor commission in Canada? Will it be that kind of model? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Um, and I mean, medicinal marijuana has been legal since I think twenty thirteen or something like that. Um, even that though is it's still has been somewhat controversial. But yeah. okay. Yeah. Thank you. So it's uh, I mean relevant to my life because I work with students. So I'm a campus minister. Um, with, uh, well, my husband and I, we work for InterVarsity Christian Fellowship Canada, but we're seconded to our French sister movement, uh, GBUC, which is part of the International Fellowship of Evangelical Students. So we, my husband is David, and he and I have been married for four years in December. And uh, we, I'm from Montreal, born and raised, and so English and French are my two first languages. But David it was born and raised in Toronto, unilingually Anglophone. And so two years ago, we moved to Quebec. I had been away for several years. We moved to Quebec, and he enrolled in one year of full-time language learning to learn French. And by the grace, utter grace and miracle of God, he was able to learn French. And he is now fluent in French, which is unbelievable because it's one of the, well, we have since learned, one of the top 10 hardest languages to learn in the world. <laughs> so he did it and we are now uh, working in French with students. So we oversee the 11 French colleges that are on the island of Montreal. Quebec has a different school system where we have a two-year pre-university college um, that Quebec residents go to and it is free. So there's no tuition. Uh, there are a little bit of fees, maybe a hundred bucks a semester. And it's all, uh, you can do a two year pre-university program and then three years of university, or you can do a three year technical program. So you can do nursing in these colleges, um, social work, uh, early childhood education, programs like that, and then can go into the workforce directly after that. And so students are there, uh, they're 17 when they start, so graduate grade 11. And then they can be anywhere from age 17 and up. Um, and so that's, and that's very true in our student groups that we have fresh into college 17 year olds to single moms who are coming back to school to get a little bit more uh, training for a job they're maybe already doing. Uh, we have students who have gone Have no practical skills <laughs> so they come back to college um yeah so our groups are very interesting for a wide range of, of students um and we are uh, planting ministry on these 11 colleges um and in a context that is uh post christian and uh we have the term laicite which the english equivalent is secularism but it doesn't quite encapsulate what laicite is but basically the the practical aspect of it is that we're not allowed to be recognized religious groups on campus um we can't be clubs we can't book space book tables put up posters do any kind of public publicity um and so it the the great gift of that is that it forces us to partner we have to find the people of peace on campus who will open doors for us Otherwise, we can't get in. And though, though that's hard, we actually see that as a really good thing, that we have to have good reason. Someone in administration or, or somebody who's out for the good of campus, can we be, can we be there? So it's, um, yeah, so that's it's stretching for us. It's different from the English context of Canada and of Quebec. Our colleagues who work on English campuses, like down the street from us, do not know the same reality. Uh, so that's the very uh, fascinating thing about one of the fascinating things about that. So I've been doing campus ministry for 10 years. Um, I am also a dancer. 
So I was a gymnast as a kid and then moved into dance when I was a teen and uh, um, absolutely love movement. It's how I'm wired. Um, and so I have taken and given many classes in all, all the styles. Um, and so one of, the, one of the exciting things right now, and that feels really pertinent to this class, is um, that I, uh, I auditioned for a Christmas show that our church is putting on and was chosen as one of the dancers. And so um, this is a huge production that the church does every year, very high caliber uh, show, original composition, like all all the things and so we're a dance team of about 14 and have four hour long rehearsals every Sunday <laughs> and I'm, it's been a long time since I've had long rehearsals like that but it at the end of each one I say to my husband my legs are like jelly everything hurts and my heart is filled with joy and so so um yeah so I'm hoping to integrate uh the the show into my final project for this course because the, the vision of the church and therefore all of the things that they do is to to reach those who are far from god to make disciples who make more disciples um so i'm, I'm hoping to interview different players in this in this show to hear more about the theology of this production um and yeah and uh, kind of the slogan of the church is a church for those who don't go so that's really what shapes how they do things. Um, so, yeah, um, my family, I come from a long line of urban missionaries. Um, and uh, so my mom and dad work for uh, uh, urban ministry here in Montreal, Christian Direction, as does my sister. Um, and my other sister is, uh, she and her husband work in international development um, in an anti-human trafficking. And uh, many pastors in the family, child protection policy writers, and um, lots of that. So, uh, so yeah, so a, a strong missiological heritage in my fam. Uh, okay, did I touch all the points? Yeah, yeah, you okay. are obviously strategically placed at, at these universities. So congratulations there, and congratulations on being a part of this uh, dance initiative for this event. I used to actually do that. I would direct the dance and march productions at a mega church in Colorado Springs for 15 years. So I know both your pain and both your joy. So and it's all worth it, isn't it? It's it's a wonderful thing. So thank you, Krista. Betty. Yes. <laughs> We're doing narratives. We just want to hear a little bit more about your life. I understand you live in a retirement community. Yes, I'm 82. <laughs> and you're beautiful. And you love to paint. Am I correct? Is your medium, is it oil or acrylic? Uh, I do a lot of things. I do acrylic. I do clay. I do mixed media. I do watercolor. I just posted a picture on um, the chapel that's watercolor and the other one uh, was an acrylic plus a little bit of collage <laughs> I like I, I get bored with the same thing so I, I like to experiment I love to learn okay. <laughs> that's fabulous and you live in Florida I live in Georgia Georgia mm -hmm. the south and where in Georgia uh, I live in Gainesville Georgia which is about 65 miles north of Atlanta by the way, I had trouble getting on today. I'm very sorry. If Krista had not given me the number, I couldn't have gotten on because when I hit it in VGU's thing, it doesn't work. I had to go back to Zoom and put in the number that Krista gave me. Otherwise, I couldn't have gotten to this class. <laughs> so well, anyway. I, apo I apologize for that. I have, I have similar stories to tell about trying to get on okay. Zoom. So I feel your pain. I wish that I had an answer for you. And Natalia might be able to help. Okay. Well, in the future, if I know the number, I, if I know the ID number, I know I can get on. I discovered that today. <laughs> right. But I appreciate Krista for helping me. And sometimes you can download a Zoom app, and then it's, it's a, you can avoid some of these uh, complications by okay. downloading the app. Well, it's all new to me, so I'm learning. But I like I to know. learn. It's, it's not new to me, and yet 
I still have issues sometimes. So no, no problem at all. We're so glad you're here. And I apologize for the complication. It's okay, it's your fault. <laughs> We're just glad you're here. <laughs> it's partly mine because I don't understand it. I'm having to learn. <laughs> I know. I know. And well, and Zoom updates, and we used to go, we used to do go to meeting, and that was a completely different process. So even even when you learn it, you're you may have to relearn it. No, which okay. isn't a bad thing. That's that's why we're in education right now, mm -hmm. to develop and grow and to learn. Right. So I wanted to just move forward on um, thank you for your narratives to you all. I just wanted to move forward and get your feedback on. Uh, just the approach that we're taking in the class and the vision of can we utilize the arts in a way to change the world? That's, a, that's in essence what we're doing. Well, in 82, I'm not going to change the world. <laughs> well, academic, who has changed the world? Uh, anyway. Christ, Christ, Christ and what he did on the cross and his resurrection is, and, the, and the power of the Holy Spirit through that is, is, the, is the force that changes the world. But that creative life force that is empowered by the Holy Spirit, correct? This is the force that emptied the tomb, is what we're talking about that is behind the creativity and the art that we're studying theologically and sociologically in this course right? to be used within the context of neighborhoods, communities, and cities. It's really very, very, very simple. It's an outrageous premise, but the foundation is simple. But then Christ was, was and is pretty outrageous. He's dangerous, he's complex, and he will call us to these things. So I just want to get your feedback on, on utilizing the arts to heal the city, that basic vision that we, we understand that the foundation is in understanding that the power is not in the arts, it's in the yeah. creative life force of who Christ is. Our power, is in our identity in Christ. If we are truly in connection with Jesus Christ, and we are in the word every day, and we are praying every day, then God downloads his love for people in the cities into our souls so that it's really very easy. That's your motivation. Right. Your motivation is to love your neighborhood, to love your community, and to love your city because it's people. And our tool, would be the art. So for me, just to give you a little narrative, a little more narrative about myself, I am, I am a dancer, I'm a dance instructor. I teach ballet, modern jazz. I run a visual arts program for socioeconomically challenged families where we offer dance classes and art classes with a focus on fullness of life. We do, we do teach technique and excellence, but we teach wholeness of life through the power of the Holy Spirit and the Father and Jesus the Son, that if we're in relationship with the Trinity, we are never alone, we are always whole. In relationship with the Trinity, then when we reach out to our neighbors and we utilize the art, say we have an art gallery in our backyard and we invite our neighbors to come, there are many, many applications here. The foundation of that is relationship with Christ because that's what transforms us. And if we're transformed, then we become transformational vehicles within the context of our city. So that's what I work to do. I'm more grassroots. I'm not doing anything massively huge because I'm not drawn to that. I'm drawn to just working with people, loving them, creating beauty, making a difference in my city. Sometimes I land in uh, situations that I don't want by God's hand. I just did one a few weeks ago that was relatively large. And so um, God uses that as well. So any comments so far? Well, I have a granddaughter that was a ballerina with Richmond in Richmond, Virginia for about four years. She's now married and has children, but uh, she um, loves ballet. She's done it since she was a little girl. So and she's a Christian, she's a believer. <laughs> Wonderful. I love Richmond. I just moved from Williamsburg, Virginia, and Richmond is a really wonderful city. So thank you, Betty. Anybody else? As far as my background, I probably would have gotten an art therapy had I not my husband not moved us. That's years and years ago because I was involved in art therapy with the schools in Houston, Texas years ago. It was fun. It's never too late, Betty. Within the context of your community, you could be utilizing the concepts of therapy creatively very easily. 
just the thought. I, I have done quite a bit of, well, not uh, enough of dance and art therapy, and I sneak it into my classes anyway, so it's never too late. Yeah. Okay. Anybody I'm else? Enjoying, I'm enjoying what I'm reading, I'm what I'm learning. Good. Good. Thank you. I, I think that the track we're on is, um, is substantive. I think it is um, very important. I think the arts can change the world. I think the arts are changing the world. That's the reality. The question is, um, are they being used appropriately? Are they well represented? Um, are there believers, are there Christ followers engaging in the arts as aggressively as those who are not Christ followers? I think, unfortunately, um, many of the arts that are put before us presently identify the problem. They don't do a good job addressing what the solution might be. They create a sense of despair, displacement, disillusionment, um, social media and some of the music today presented by extremely talented artists uh, serves up a conversation that's really rooted around mistrust or the utilization of God's gifts for um, mainly selfish ends, uh, purposeless ends. So the arts are powerful. I, I tell the church once in a while, if you don't believe that a uh, spoken word can uh, move the universe and create a cosmos you need to sit next to a, a car with its base turned way up and the windows down at a stoplight uh, that sound will move you uh, there is um, so whether it's music or it's art and advertising or it's what complex mathematic algorithms serve up to us on the surface of our computers or our social media sites. Interestingly, most of what we're confronted with on a daily basis is the arts. Now, math and science may be behind it, but we love to interface with ideas. And, and the question is, are the right ideas being brought before us? Are they front and center? And how are we vetting these ideas? So um, I'm I'm a big believer in where we're going. I, I think it's really um, of huge importance. I, so I told you already, I, I tend to take what the classroom gives me and take it to the platform in our church. And I'm already trying to think about how do I frame up that conversation because I'm gonna be preaching in November. But what, one of the ways I've thought about doing this is by each week adding chairs on the platform, and they're empty chairs, I'm just saying this is who's not here. This is who's not speaking because we haven't made a place for them. We haven't given a canvas for them. We haven't given a dance floor for them. We haven't given um, a musical spot for them. Here's the people that's welcome on our platform right now. It's very narrow. It's very, pardon me, stupid. Um, it, does not it does not reward um, um, diversity, complexity, richness. It is highly repetitive, highly boring. I, I mean, I love our church, but it just, it, there's so many people left out of the conversation. And these would be forces for, for a, a great creative God. Um, so I'm, I'm a big believer in where we're going. I'm, I'm enjoying the reading. I, I thought Barr's book, this Echoes of Eden, was just so um, right on target. So I, I don't want to talk too much, but I, I, I'm, I'm really in agreement with where we're going. And really nice to hear everybody's stories. Um, appreciate everyone's involvement. Anthony, if I hear what you're saying, you are commenting on the fact that our churches are institutions of conformity. We have trained our people in the pedagogy of the oppressed, an amazing book by Friere. It's one of the recommended readings. I would recommend that book to be in your library. I read it many times. I have read it many times and reference it many times. We have trained our culture to be passive and to be narrow. And it is the church through the power of Jesus Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit that is supposed to break through that. How do we do that? How do we work innovation and creativity into the realm of 
the church when we are feeling safer within the bubble of conformity? The answer to that is complex and very simple, and that's essentially what we're dealing with. Right. And, and this is critically important. So thank you. And you know, I, insights. You know, I, I mean, I almost think part of our fear in my church tradition, strangely enough, is almost iconoclastic. Historically, there's a sense that, well, it's somehow wrong to put pictures on the wall or um, some strange interpretation of, um, you know, the, the first commandment, if you will. So, um, but, but, but you, I was walking in the community around our church a couple months ago, and I emerged from it to see our church with new eyes. And, and 